Yo, yo, yo. What up? What's going on? What's up, Psycho? What's up, Mithril? What's up, guys? What to do? Happy Sunday, man. Mithril, how how was your Sunday? Your Sunday's about over, dog. <laughs> What's going on, man? Well, not about over quite, but it's definitely on the verge of it, right? On the verge of turning over, dude. What's up, everybody? How are ya? How are ya? Um. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Four degrees. Yeah. Word. All right, dog. Yeah. Getting all cozy. Yeah, getting all cozy. I keep forgetting, dude, that like it's it's opposite seasons over there for you. You know. I always I always tend to forget uh, until you remind me about it. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Um, it's actually pretty overcast for us today. Uh, I think we got we got some, maybe some storms rolling in actually. Yeah, it's supposed to be a rainy day, dude, which is awesome because I love overcast and stormy weather and stuff. Yeah, it's still gonna be not like it. We're, it'll be it'll be decently temps and everything, but it's gonna be like overcast and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew it was down around there. I didn't know exactly. But thanks, man. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> One second, yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause we have to. We use like an opposite measuring system for literally everything, dude, than the rest of the world. You know, because some stupid reason. I don't know. Doesn't make any sense. But yeah, appreciate that, dude. <laughs> um. So we got. Uh, this is the plan for today. We're gonna do. Um. The news, like always, right? We'll do the news. Then we'll uh, play a little bit of, we'll probably get like two to three hours, something like that, of um, grounded in. And then it should be the Xbox uh, Starfield showcase popping off at noon. So we'll take like a lunch break. We'll probably take a break just a little bit before that so I can make some lunch. And um, that way, like during the showcase, uh, I'll eat and, uh, you know, everybody else can prepare some snacks or, you know, whatever. If you want to eat, what, whatever the case may be. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll do that and uh, we'll, we'll have lunch and then we'll um, do some more grounded for a, a couple a couple hours probably depends on how long an xbox star starfield showcase goes um and then we will end up the day on our other showcase which should be the um future gaming show no pc gaming show my bad pc gaming show at three o'clock p.m today so at three uh my time cst uh or 1500 hours whatever you want uh, we should end with the um, the PC gaming show. So it'll be like news, gaming, Xbox Starfield showcase. So we'll break up the gaming there, do some more gaming and ground it. Then we'll be back to the PC gaming show around 1500 hours. Um, so it'll be it'll be a, a bit of a, a wonky day as far as the schedule goes, but we'll just try to uh, try to make it work. You know what I mean? We've just got these these showcases that are kind of spread uh, throughout the day here. So we'll make it work, man. And then tomorrow we've got uh, Ubisoft at 12 and then we've got Capcom at uh, 1500. So that's what's on the horizon for us. That's what's going on, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool, Gothic, awesome. Uh, wait, what do you mean? Still got sleep in my eyes? You are you just saying am I still tired or whatever? Yeah, a little bit. If that's what you're asking, I, don't, I mean, does, do I it, or do you mean it looks like I've got stuff on my face or in my eyes? <laughs> I mean, it's early, dog. It's early for me, dude. It's early, bro. I'm always a little bit tired when I start. I literally just wake up at like five in the morning. I start getting ready and I start streaming, bro. <laughs> I haven't had but like half a cup of coffee, man. 
<laughs> I'm always tired when I start, bro. If that's what you're getting at, I'm always tired when I start, man. All right, all right, let's do this. This is what we're listening to this morning, by the way. Uh, bam. So, um, listening to some uh, BPM stuff. Yeah. Uh, we listen to this all the time because uh, this is like one of my my favorite gaming soundtracks. This uh, this soundtrack is uh, a banger, dude. It's full of just jams. It's not real long, but uh, all the the uh, music in the soundtrack is just fantastic. And the game is dope too, dude. I, I will never quit promoting BPM. For anybody that likes first-person shooters, uh, roguelike games, um, this is this is where it's at, dude. And it's rhythm-based too. Rhythm-based game. It's a very, very good rhythm-based game. So if you're into that kind of stuff, then uh, check this out. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a very, very cool game. Or if you just like the music, go grab the soundtrack. That supports the dev as well. And uh, it's a it, this is an indie dev, dude. So. Um, if the game sounds dope, check it out. Very cool art style in it as well. And uh, if you just like the music, go check the music out. You know what I mean? Good stuff. Go ahead and kill it and get into the news. Let's get in here. What's up, Gothic? Psycho, what up, my dude? Got to work till 8. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, dude. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, bro. Sorry, broski. Let's go ahead and get into the news here. Uh, we'll talk about schedule again at the end of the news segment, and uh, we'll touch on this again today. I think there are some pretty good sales there for people to get in on. Um, so, we know this is coming, but I've been trying to stay away from spoilers as much as possible. I, I, I find it ridiculous that people just uh, try to data mine this stuff whenever we know it's coming to us anyways. Um Everybody wants to like data mine and know what's coming. Dude, it's, that's like, to me, it takes all the fun out of the, um, the showcase season, you know? Um, we're going to find out what we're going to get whenever the showcase happens, you know? And, um, it, it's, it's, to me, it's like the same notion as like, going and searching, like if you're a kid and, and you've got a holiday coming up and you know, you're going to be getting some presents it's like trying to go and, and search around and sneak around and find out what you're going to get before you even get to open your presents. So then you got to like act surprised about it or whatever. Dude, I want to be surprised. I want to be surprised about it. I don't necessarily, I don't want to be, I don't want to be spoiled on what the showcase is going to provide me, you know? So, um, I find it crazy that, that everybody is always like trying to data mine this stuff down to the nth degree dude and 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 find out everything that's going to be in these showcases before they drop that it's going to happen you're going to get all the info that you're, you're supposed to get out of the showcase I, I don't understand that that like mindset about that uh i i get i get like hyped up and giddy for this stuff you know what i mean i guess not wick i guess not and um, I like I like the uh, the excitement that comes from the uh, the showcase, getting to watch the showcases themselves, and then have something uh, present itself that I maybe wasn't expecting or wasn't ready for. You know, I think that's fun. I think that's neat. And it's like we we had that PlayStation showcase, like the Capcom uh, whenever they at the PlayStation showcase, they dropped Dragon's Dogma too. Dude, that was big hype for me, man. I love that. Um, so it's crazy to me that everybody just data mines the crap out of this, you know, it's nuts, dude. <laughs> now I don't gotta worry because it's no presence word. Cool. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right, sorry guys. Sorry. All right. 
Let's go. Let's see what we got. Yo, by the way, uh, I found a decent deal this morning. I put it in the gamer deal section. Check it out. Uh, uh, there's a gigabyte Aorus, a terabyte M.2 drive. Um, it's got a nanocarbon coated heat sink on it and everything. It's a terabyte for 70 bucks, man. I put it in the, uh, here, check it out. I'll pull it up real quick. This guy right here, it's in the gamer deals section. I posted it in there this morning. If you guys are in the uh, market for any more storage space or whatever, You guys are wild, dude. The, uh, this might, and, and it, it states that this is a uh, PS5 compatible too. PS5 compatible. So if anybody's rocking a PS5, you need more storage space. Uh, this might be a decent, uh, <laughs> for you right here. Okay. Gross wick. It's got a five year warranty on it. Um, so supposed to be a pretty decent drive you can see it's about it's over half off right now and um this is supposed to be uh i'm not real familiar with the site that this is off of what what site was this off of uh ooh, dude dude where's it at oh ant online but i i heard they're pretty legit um, from what I understand, that's a pretty legit website and everything. So if you're interested, uh, you might be able to get a pretty nice little, uh, terabyte solid state drive M.2 drive there. Uh, it is in the uh, discord, by the way, if you guys need it, you can go grab it there. I, I linked it in there. I don't care, dude. God, I'm so sick of it. Just stop. Future of Play Direct. This is some of the stuff we saw yesterday, right? So we'll just recap a little bit of that. Just uh, everything leaking out of what the showcases are supposed to be bringing to us. I hate the fact that it just spoils the hype. It, it drives me nuts. Nobody can get hyped up about anything because everything just gets spoiled. You know, it's what I was just talking about. It's just gross that you can't just like, this is one of my favorite times of the year for gaming because there, it's a lot of hype buildup, you know what I mean? And, um, I love, I love being able, it's like, it's, it's like, it's like, it's like gamers Christmas, dude. You know what I mean? Or, or gamers Hanukkah or whatever, you know, cause we get so many days, dude, of, of, um, you know, it's, it's like our holiday season, man. And um, I don't want to know what I'm getting before I get it. You know, that's that's my thing. I've never been one of those people that wanted to know, like, what I was getting before I was going to get a present or whatever. I, I want I want to I want to be I want I, I like the anticipation. I like being hyped and like being surprised and stuff, you know. So. Yeah, like I, I want, I want to enjoy. I mean, that's why, that's why we do this. Why I watch all the shows here, and that's why I like to watch it with you guys and everything. You know, it's uh, I like, I like being able to like chill out and you know, whenever big stuff comes, because we all have our preferences, we all have our things we're looking for and everything. You know, you guys can see whenever I get hyped about stuff, and I can tell when you guys get hyped about certain things too. You know, I think that's fun, man. It's fun for me, but I, I hate the fact that everybody just data mines the crap out of out of it. And, leaks the crap out of everything that's going to be shown and it's like man it just takes all the fun out of it man like we know you like divulging things right wick <laughs> nice dude nice 
Um, well, I mean, look, dude, um, just be, a uh, be an e-girl. <laughs> All right, psycho. <laughs> oh, no, oh, you no, finished no, playing no, Alana no. nicely. <laughs> 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 God, I love that sound effect. You tried dude. it. <laughs> Yo, Psycho, just uh, don't worry about a camera. Not look. If I mean to be real, um, there are there are plenty of content creators. If you're actually serious about trying to dive into the streaming space or whatever, there are plenty of streamers out there that don't use a camera. So, um, and there are some very successful ones out there that don't use a camera. You don't have to use a camera to be a streamer, duck. You know what I mean? So, um, or there are plenty of people out there that use a camera, but don't actually show their face or whatever. There are a lot of different ways to be creative about it. Um, so you just got to figure out what you want to do. But I think that you'd be much better off just using an e-girl avatar. You know what I mean? Seems to be the play nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's the perfect sentiment right there, Mithril. I try to express that sentiment all the time to people that that uh, talk to me about you know uh, entertaining the idea of being a content creator, a live streamer, and stuff. It's like you know you need to you need to not try and necessarily be doing what is. I think having the mindset of trying to do what you think other people want you to do is not the way to go about it. In my opinion, and this is just my opinion, Mithril captured it perfectly right there. You know, you need to be doing what, what you want to do, do what's comfortable for you, you know, and, and, you know, be getting out of it, what you, you want to get out of it, you know? <clears throat> so, in respect to that, there's a lot of different ways to be a content creator and a broadcaster. And um, you just have to kind of take some time to really maybe like meditate on that, if you will, and, and think about it and determine what, what that's going to be for you. It doesn't mean that things won't maybe change a little bit as you move forward with it, if you really do dive into it, because that's, that's I think, a given. But, um, you know, having that, like, kind of like we were talking about this yesterday, having that, that core, you know, idea for what you want to be, what you want your community to be and stuff, I think is, is important to begin with. And I don't think a lot of that will change if you really uh, get that established in the first place, you know. I'm tangled. Yeah, Man, I had googly eyes. I didn't even realize I was sitting there trying to be real. Wix got me got got me trying to be real with googly eyes on, dude. Jesus, <sighs> shenanigans. Yeah, the new Lords of the Fallen trailer was pretty dope. This game looks like it could be good. It's shenanigans, dude. Yeah. Oh, wait, dude, what was, uh, how was, how was all of planet Alana, by the way, dude? If you're finished choking on your toothbrush. Oh, Risen 5 5600 X3D rumor? Really? Huh. 
I didn't think they were going to go back and make any more of the uh, the AM4 X3D chips. I thought they were just already done moving on. You know? Interesting. <laughs> Yo, somebody please send this to Cash, dude. God dang it. Somebody please, dude. I don't think he's in my Discord. Bro, I'm gonna have to save this for him. <laughs> yeah, we talked about this. We talked about this before the game even hit, right? It was like, yo, that this is one of the areas in which I would really like to see Nintendo improve. Voice acting, dude. Voice acting in their games. And I was like, you know, the voice acting in Breath of the Wild was real slim. Not that it's a hugely narrative-driven game or anything, but I would love to see them improve on the front of voice acting. And and uh, it's like just the same thing in Tears of the Kingdom, really, isn't it? I mean, same thing. I haven't played all the way, th you know, I haven't played very much Tears of the Kingdom yet, but I, I imagine it's just about the same thing in Tears of the Kingdom than it was Breath of the Wild from what I've seen so far. And... Uh, That's funny. That's funny. Yeah, we're going to watch that. We're going to watch that. Bro, <laughs> yo, this year's Wholesome Direct showcased over 70 cozy and uh, uplifting indie games of which 65 of them were life and farming sims. <laughs> God dang, dude. I mean, am I wrong? <laughs> Bro, I was getting so tired. Of, it's like this every year. I mean, it's like this every year. It's it's almost like a prerequisite to be a part of like wholesome direct showcase almost is that like if you want to be considered a cozy cozy and uplifting uh indie game to be a part of that showcase you have to be either a um farming sim or a life sim you know <laughs> God it literally was like 90% of those games dude Not that there's anything wrong with a life sim game or a farm sim game or anything like that. There are a, a ton of amazing games. But, dude, it was almost like just watching a spinoff of the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over over that entire showcase, you know? It's like, here's another one. Here's another one. Oh, now you're a vampire that gets to farm. <laughs> it's, like, it's like basically the same thing. Yeah, the memo everybody got. Yeah, yeah. It's like that every year, but God, it it, it just gets old, old sitting there watching it. It's like here's another one, man. Resistor's basically a burnout RPG. What? I don't know what I've heard about that. Future is bright. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 Future Redeemed. What? Yeah, we've already talked about this. New Friday the 13th is being developed. We know that. When are we going to get this standalone uh, Freddy game, though? You know? When? When that, though? Yo, I actually talked about this on stream yesterday. This was wild, dude. And this is not gaming news, but this is incredibly impressive. A plane went down in the um, Amazon in Colombia. Both pilots and a mother died and four kids. One was 13, one was like eight or nine, one was four, and one was one year old. And they're all alive. All the kids are alive 40 days later. All the adults died in the plane crash. All the kids survived, and they found all these kids alive in the Amazon 40 days later. I talked about this on stream just a little bit yesterday. 
actually bonkers, dude. Yeah, yeah, insane. That 13-year-old um, had to have just been doing work, Doug. Because you know, like, those other kids, dude, you know that they 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 weren't going to be on that same level, you know. That that eight and nine year old probably helped out as much as possible. Probably grounded, bro. I mean, you think about the Amazon, Doug, you know, on the reels. You're talking about big jungle cats, like gnarly stuff in the Amazon, dude. Gnarly stuff. Um, and those kids all are, are alive and doing well 40 days later. That's crazy, dog. I wouldn't have lasted two days. <laughs> I would have died of starvation, dude. I would have eaten a berry, a bad berry. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'd have been like, I'm so hungry, chat. Where's chat? Chat, help. It's impressive, dude. It's really, really cool. Uh oh, we got a deal on a monitor. What's this? <sighs> Save two hundo, two hundo on a thirty two inch. Uh... View Sonic monitor? Planet of Lonnet. Yeah, dude. What's up? Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a 1440p monitor. 165 uh, hertz refresh rate. Half a millisecond response time. It's pretty solid, dude. It's pretty solid. Um, I wonder if... Uh, hold on. Apparently, you can get a pretty good deal on it right now. Let me see if Artings has this uh, reviewed. Doesn't look like it. Boo. All right. But if you're interested, uh, if you're in the market for a monitor or anything, you might take a look. Might take a look at that, okay. Oh, baby, psycho. That's what I'm talking about, dog. Sick, man. Nice. Yo, feed me the stats on that bad boy. Let me know exactly what you're getting, dog. Feed me the stats. Like, uh, how big is it curved, right? What's the uh, what's the uh, hertz on it? Refresh rate, like that kind of stuff, dog. Yeah, baby, let's go, dude. I'm psyched for you, man. Yeah. Gameplay. Don't know how low to go. So gameplay was about six and a half. It was just a bit like. How many hours did you get in that game? It didn't take you very long to get through it, huh? So graphics were dope. Soundtrack was dope. But gameplay was maybe a bit underwhelming. So you mean gameplay being just like... Was it just kind of boring? It, it Was it just more of a, like a, uh, a visual experience then? I guess maybe Wick. How many hours did you get, buddy? What? So hard to stay away from the spoiler stuff. Two puzzles you got stuck on. Oh, okay, word. Nice. All right.
Yeah, let's go to our other search. Hold on. Wait, what was that? God of War Studio maybe making a new sci-fi game. We'll pull that up real quick. Talking about Santa Monica? Santa Monica Studios? <laughs> Bro, I wasn't going to say anything, dude. <laughs> <laughs> this ingenious summer games fest indie needs to be on your radar uh we'll take a peek i think we saw it yeah let's fanga yeah we saw this but let's take another peek at it real quick <sighs> Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, it seems like it was more of just like a a uh, chill, like visual experience, right? Like something to just kick back with. Did you say how many hours you got out of it, dude? Like they didn't focus on the gameplay near as much as they did of just giving you a nice like visual vibe, right? To be fair, there are a lot of games out there that can give you a really nice gameplay experience with a visual vibe, but there are a lot of games out there that also just focus on like giving you that nice, chill, uh, like immersive visual experience too. Like take something like, uh, what is it, Absu? Like a game like that. There's not a whole lot to the gameplay really. It's basically just a visual experience. And there's nothing wrong with that for, from time to time. You know, a lot of people like that kind of stuff. That's okay. But then there's stuff like maybe Ori, you know what I mean? Ori's a beautiful flipping game, but it's got amazing, you know, gameplay elements and stuff too. So six to eight hours, maybe. Oh, okay, cool. Thanks, man. Cool. Good to know. Good to know. Thanks, man. What is this? Did I pull this up? Oh, the cocoon stuff. Oh, a bug's life too. Yeah, yeah. We saw all this stuff. All right, I'm not I'm not gonna dive into that. We saw all that. Yes, yeah, Stray Gods looks wild. We had seen that before the uh showcases here recently too, but not in as much depth. Oh baby god, Liza P, Liza P. I'm pulling that up. I can't not. I've been stoked about Liza P for a long time. And uh, we're getting really close to that game dropping. So, I hope it's good, dude. Okay, here's an article for us to, to take on and talk about. PS Plus and Game Pass are dying. Author says, I couldn't be happier. I don't think they're dying, dude. I don't think they're dying. We'll read this and we'll we'll discuss this. We'll dissect this a little bit and discuss it. I don't think they're dying. Here's here's what I think is going on. I'll tell you exactly what I think is happening. The industry is bleak right now on the front of decent games, which is what subscription services kind of thrive on, you know. Obviously, Game Pass and PS Plus differ from one another. It, it, the main difference being Game Pass gives everybody day one access if you're into the ultimate side of it, right? PS Plus will never, they're saying they'll never give you that kind of access. But um, for, for day one release, right? Access to those day one releases. But ultimately, like the, 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 the industry has just been plagued with bad games here over the past year to year and a half. Not that there haven't been some good ones too, but subscription services are going to thrive or die depending on the content that they can put on those services, right? And if the industry is just doing a very bad job overall of coming out with new games that are – 
either good with content and 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 feel very polished they'll thrive games it, it, on, on like we're dealing with now and half for about the past year year and a half and to to a great extent where you know they just have bad content and continue to come out in a very very unpolished state and are, are nigh unplayable you know they're gonna suffer so we'll dissect this a bit well there's no storytelling in it really Oh, really? really? Oh, that's weird, Wick. Okay. Well, that's one of those things I talk about all the time too, Gothic, is like any subscription service, whether it be for gaming or uh, any form of entertainment, like subscription services like uh, Netflix for movies and, and television shows or whatever, because there's a ton of those nowadays too, right? Netflix, Paramount, HBO, Peacock. I mean, you name it, dude. You know, if you're not getting your money's worth... Doesn't make sense, does it? Same thing for a gaming subscription service. If you're not playing it enough, why are you paying for it? Doesn't make sense, right? And I think that's something that people have to, you know, is what you're paying for it worth the amount of time that you're getting out of it? That's going to be different for each individual person, right? So, but um, sometimes it's going to also be one of those situations where people will play more on those services if they have good content to play, right? And if you don't have good content to play on the constant, which is what a subscription service should be providing you, you're not going to be getting your money's worth because you're, there's nothing pulling you in to play on that platform, right? So that's where they're losing subscribers also, yeah? People, psycho, people are tired of having to pay to play free stuff. Elaborate, dude. Oh, not hot fixes a day to a few months. Oh, yeah, I mean, I do. I talk about that all the time. <clears throat> Games should never come out where they're looking at, you know. <laughs> Dude, I've been bang. I've been. I've been uh, really, really harping on CDPR a lot because they're really, you know, there's a lot of info that's been coming out about um, their DLC that's dropping and and what the price point's going to be for it, and you know. Uh, a lot of other stuff too, and and I'm not a fan of CDPR. They're one of the most notorious modern day examples of a terrible, terrible release. And they knew what they were doing. They, and if you want numbers, as of September of last year, they had they had sold over 20 million copies of Cyberpunk. Of those 20 million, they sold 13 million of those as either pre-orders or unreleased copies, retail. Which made them, if you had a static $60 price point, it was well over, I mean, uh, close to like $800 million they made off that game, just off pre-orders, if it was a $60 static price point. Um, almost $800 million they made just at the, the pre-order and release of that game as opposed to the just over 300 million they put into the development. And that game was a busted piece of crap. And now they want to come out with the expansion and charge people 40, 35, 40 bucks for that and stuff. You know, it's like, so I've been putting out these videos on the news. There, there are certain people that, that are, you know, you can tell you, I get these, these same people that have come out to the, these videos that I put out harping on these bad developers and stuff and and uh they throw a fit every time i put a, a video out talking trash about it. truth hurts dude you know <laughs> truth hurts man i mean look i wouldn't be putting videos out about this kind of stuff if if, if you know they were doing good work but dude they they cheated 13 million people on the release of that game 
they marketed and promoted the crap out of that game and knew it wasn't ready, dude. They knew that game was it didn't it didn't run on any platform well. It ran better on PC than it did anything else, but it still wasn't good, you know. I agree, Psycho. I've been talking about that. I've been talking about that. Look, I mean, in the business world, you know, because look, gaming's a business, just like any other manufacturing business, right? You're they're making a product, and um, in my opinion, there should be laws about it, dude. Because basically, you know, what they're doing is they're making a a product that is faulty all the time. All the time you get these these big uh, developers that are making faulty products um, and they're pushing it out anyways. And then basically they're just stealing money from people. And making them believe the product's going to be good by do, be putting big marketing behind it and stuff, right? And um, it's not acceptable, dude. It's it's a business like any other business. They should be held accountable for it, in my opinion. It's not it's not acceptable, you know. So I hear you, dude. I hear you. Yeah. <sighs> oh, so like Xbox Neverwinter, you can't play without Xbox Live. Free on PSN and PC. Don't need PS Plus. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, you say it's free on PSN, right? But I mean, that's a, that's an online game, isn't it? Neverwinter? Isn't Neverwinter an online game? So then you would have to have PlayStation Network to play it, Doug. Because you can't play online games without buying into PlayStation's online network, right? All the consoles are like that. Am I missing something here? Yeah, I mean, you know, in your example of 2K there, dude, that's a, you know, 2K, EA, you know, flipping Blizzard and, and Active. There's a, a ton of scummy corporations up at the top, you know, big developers that do that crap all the time, you know. They just send out broken games, cyber, you know, like CDPR. Send out broken games. They look at the they uh, the ability to touch the games after the fact is a crutch, dude. They don't they don't look at and look. I'm not just blaming the development side of things either. I'm never going to pretend that I know exactly what's going on in each individual situation here with all these terrible game releases. But the industry's plagued with it, and I don't care. People can argue all day long. Well, well, it's not the development side; it's the marketing side, and the marketing is going to go. Well, it wasn't us, you know. It was the the producer that did it, producer's going to go, well, my developers were trash. And it's all going to be a bunch of finger pointing. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Whatever the case may be, these companies that are involved in the project pushed out a, pro pushed out a product that wasn't ready. They were all, they're all to blame. They're all to blame. The, all of their names are on it. They're all to blame. The, 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 and don't get me wrong, there's, there's always unforeseen issues with games it's different day one patches are a thing because there's going to be unforeseen issues but there's a difference between some small buggy issues that need to be fixed on day one or like maybe within the the a short amount of time after release and a game that is released in an absolutely stupidly broken state with just crashes and stuttering and and a constant frame drop and you know cut scenes you can't watch and you know, all kinds of crap like that that the companies knew was going to happen, but they pushed it out anyways. That's unacceptable. They should be held accountable for that. And that's my thing. There, there aren't a lot of rules and regulations about it for the gaming industry. So what my thing is, is like raising awareness about it, because if we don't quit supporting those companies as the consumer, it's just going to continue to happen, dude. You know?
they're just going to continue to do that kind of crap to us. And that's where I'm like, because there aren't rules and regulations. If we want it to stop, we have to quit supporting those companies that do that crap. Oh, you don't have PSN and you can play it? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, right on. But we'll talk about this. I already started ranting. Dang it. Yeah, we read about this yesterday. It's so stupid that people are throwing a fit. Like, it's like people, they're, uh, a bunch of incels out there, dude, that are throwing a fit about the fact that there's some legit statistical information proof that has come out that like literally half of gamers are women. Almost like half of the humans on the earth are also women. Weird. Almost like women enjoy the same, the same things as everybody else in the world does. What? Why, why, how are there so many just ignorant, idiotic people in the world? We read this article yesterday. Oh, no, you're fine, psycho. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the way a lot of people act about it, right? It's so stupid, dude. Like, there's just a bunch of incels out there that, that, uh, I don't know, a bunch of, bunch of idiots, dude. There were a bunch of, we read about this yesterday, and a bunch of people were throwing a fit, a bunch of dudes were throwing a fit about it. Like, I don't know. We we read about it and it's it sucks. It's terrible because the you know women are not treated the same in a lot of gaming environments. You know, especially the competitive scene. Um, we've seen all kinds of research and and studies and stuff that have proven that, and it's unfortunate. I just don't understand why people are like that, dude. Contra, what a banger of a game, dude. If you want to see more about this, my, my new segment from yesterday isn't uh, public on YouTube yet, but it will be later today. I dive into that entire thing. What is this? Oh, gross, dude. You're promoting nin Nintendo? Pass. That's the scummiest of scummies, dude, in the, the, uh, the console world right now. Hard pass, dude. Yo, I did watch the, uh, the Mario Brothers movie last night, though, so I guess I, I'm supporting Nintendo. I got kids, though, dude. And uh, they loved it, bro. They loved it. It was, it was actually pretty good. It was pretty good, yeah. I still could just hear Chris Pratt the entire time I watched it, though. <laughs> I couldn't not picture him, dude. It was so hard. I could just hear Chris Pratt the entire time as Mario. That's what I was afraid of, too. It, 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 I couldn't help it. But the movie was good. The movie was good. It was solid. Uh, we'll look at some Assassin's Creed Mirage stuff real quick. Why not? No, just random mode time. Let's go. Tantico. Wait, what? Pokemon to release complete pocket guide? Okay. Last page. Um... There's more uh, new AEW Fight Forever uh, footage out there if you want to look into it. I'm not, we've talked a lot about AEW Fight Forever. The biggest thing for me that... Uh, yo, Pinky, what up, dog? Um, the biggest thing for me about... Oh, weird, dude. It didn't cap of that. Did it finally get fixed? <laughs> I didn't even touch it. Odd. Um... The biggest thing for me about AEW Fight Forever is that we're finally actually getting another wrestling game into uh, major platforms. 
And um, that's going to bring about competition for 2K's WWE game, which is desperately needed because like Psycho was just talking about, 2K is a terrible flipping developer. They And especially on these fronts where they don't have any other competitors, like the, the wrestling games and stuff, dude, those games just get released as big busted pieces of crap all the time. And they don't really care because there's nothing else for people to go buy and play, right? They don't have competition. So hopefully now that there's another wrestling game coming out that uh, will bring about some competition that will help elevate that quality, you know what I mean? The, the It'll raise competition, make the other company make each company be like yo we need to do better we gotta we gotta compete you know oh, oh i got you pinky yeah Unreleased episodes of Alan Wake 2 leaked through new stolen videos. God dang, dude. Why? This is, a, I mean, I talk about this a lot. It feels so bad that, like, <sighs> developers just can't flip in ever. I, I, I can only imagine what it's like. I mean, you know, we talk a lot about how tight-lipped Nintendo is all the time. We can't even find out whenever they're doing Nintendo Directs anymore until, like, the day of. I understand why. It sucks. I hate it, but I understand why. It's so hard, dude. It's got to be so hard to be a developer in the gaming industry without people just always attacking you for information. For things that you're not ready to uh, talk about or release yet, you know? And uh, this is one of those terrible things that I think is one of the most catastrophic actions in um harming the relationship between the developers themselves and us as the fans of gaming and the consumers of their their products it sucks so bad that people can't just and it's not most of us dude there's just a, there's a number of people in the industry that just won't quit doing this crap um i promise everybody that whenever developers are ready to give us information about a now game now that we're friends again is it okay if I pet you? Holy crap! Thanks, Thanks dude. dude. <laughs> Yo, is it okay if I pet you? Psycho Thetril just resubscribed for two months. I'm so happy. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it, Psycho. Um, I promise that whenever developers are ready to give us the information about the games that they're working on and, and pushing out and everything, they're they're going to give it to us. But whenever people do this kind of crap and, and like leak this information they're not supposed to have or, or steal stuff from the, the development process of these games they're not supposed to have and they leak it out and everything, it it's not good, dude. It's not good for anybody. It's not good for the developer. It's not good for us. It forces the developer's hand. It sucks, dude. And I just don't understand why people can't just chill out let the developers work on their their stuff and and give it to us whenever they're ready for it it's not good it doesn't do anything positive at all it really doesn't it sucks pet the troll there you go dude and i think uh, the worst part about it is that it it, <clears throat> it harms it continues to just harm the relationship uh between us and the developers to where it makes developers more and more and more reluctant to have open lines of communication with us, which we need. It's terrible, dude.
Yeah, we saw that yesterday. Uh, Morning is also going to be on Xbox. That looked cool. Yeah, we saw that. These gaming news websites, dude, uh, or this website is so tough to read. It's, uh, it, they're always trans, uh, translated very poorly. They're written in a different language and translated over to English, and it's really, really bad. All right, let's stick with this. Stick with this. Are you petting me, dog? Look at you petting me. Assassin's Creed Mirage, <clears throat> new gameplay details, parkour from NZO Games. This dude, what's funny is I didn't even expect this. I found this like uh, filter randomly, and I think it like everybody loves it more than any of the other filters that I got for the cam, dude. People love to pet. <laughs> People love to pet, dude. <laughs> That's so wild. Uh, I didn't expect people to love that filter so much, dude. People love it. Um, Assassin's Creed Mirage, new gameplay details, parkour from NZO Games, response, responsive AI, target tracking, and much more. You want AC Mirage? Yeah. It's supposed to be a throwback to the... Uh, uh, they're supposed to be trying to get closer to their roots with what the AC games were in the past. There was a lot of outcry for it from what like AC Valhalla became. So massive open world, just kind of open ended, never really felt like you could really truly end it or anything, you know. Ubisoft is seen going back to its roots with the debut gameplay trailer of Assassin's Creed Mirage, a return to the roots. The company has planned to focus on linear and stealth oriented gaming experience over its usual action based open world narratives, at least over recent with those games, right? With a short span of two minutes, this new trailer is brimming with many details uh, for its fans and players. The first glimpse of the gameplay was released at the PlayStation Showcase, which we saw. Yeah. Later, Ubisoft released a detailed video showing behind-the-scenes glimpses of Assassin's Creed Mirage, reviving the original aspects of the game, such as stealth assassinations and parkour. The developers pre present their tributes to the beginning of, of this franchise. What to expect from the game. One of the features revealed in the video is the intense parkour ability offered by this new game, especially focusing on speed and smoothness. Marco Maresca, the senior game designer, said that they approached the parkour technique closer to the NZO games, maintaining comfort based on momentum and flow. This time, developers are also offering classics-inspired stealth abilities like hiding in plain sight that expresses the intense use of responsive AI. Set in an old school environment showing 9th century Baghdad, many old gaming elements from the franchise are returning in Assassin's Creed Mirage, including corner swings and elevators for reaching the ground quickly. Players can now in, uh, investigate targets and track them for assassinations. Assassin's Creed Mirage is also returning to classic kill moves like the aerial assassinations and throwing knives at close distances. Despite classic moves, the game is also offering new focus abilities for uh, assassins to quickly mark the enemy and kill several targets. Presenting the gameplay with a bluish desaturation filter similar to Assassin's Creed 2007, this new game is likely to trigger the nostalgia of fans. Take a look. Here you go, Psycho. If there will be a new Witcher, yeah, we talked about it yesterday in the news. When we got the opportunity there's, to there's work a bunch on the of new Witcher stuff the series, being made. we sat down with the There's rest actually of the an entirely new Witcher game specifically fans, centered around the role of the game with most one. Um, what are they calling Many it? Many of us felt the desire uh, to revisit some of the old imagery, yeah, and narrative theme right and right gameplay that made us fall in love with the series. After 15 years of journeys across there's the ages, there's that and then the there's like a couple of other uh Witcher games that are already in development. But the, I think the uh, the one, the next one about Geralt is in, uh, well into development, and then they're remaking uh, the first Witcher also, a complete remake, not and creating an experience that is a not just like a graphical overhaul. They're completely remaking um, the Witcher to bring the feel of the early games into the modern day. We are going back to the Middle East, but this time in 9th century Baghdad. 300 years before Again, the time of that's all in my news segment from yesterday, Asim, which isn't public yet on YouTube, Asim. but it will be later today. We look at the first AC games and started to wonder what exactly defined the assassin experience to us. And from there, we put all our effort into bringing our take on the assassin fantasy. And for the new Witcher game, um, 
As they've done one, parkour is a key pillar to the experience. The new Witcher game, they're moving over to, uh, they're ditching their their engine that they've been using for so long, and uh, they're moving over to Unreal Engine 5. And just to put the emphasis Thank on God. comfort and fluidity. Mirage, Hopefully it'll get rid of all these bugs they've learn, been dealing with forever. Our approach is closer to the SEO games, where it's all about keeping the flow and the momentum going, with the design centered around verticality. Many elements from past games are making a return. We have the corner swing, the ability to vault over objects, elevators to quickly reach high ground, but also new ingredients, such as the pole vault, allowing you to cross large gaps between two rooftops. Of course, Basim is faster and more agile than Ivor was. And to keep that feeling, we worked our animations to reinforce the sense of speed when jumping, vaulting, and free roaming. Streets are narrower, denser, and packed with obstacles to navigate. By choosing the right path through the environment, you can move from street level to the rooftops in a blink of an eye. Yo, I, I want to see a mod. I want to see a mod for this game where um, instead of this. Uh, we want players to work in the shadows, plan their next move. Instead of this character model, they replace it with Gollum. There are more ways to assassinate. The Gollum the game we, we deserved, you know. Some leveraging a stealthy approach. <laughs> Others delivering a violent killing blow. We also have direct throwbacks to the first games with moves like the bench assassination. Too soon? Recognized from AC2. Or the kill from the rooftop gardens, an old favorite of Altair's. We want to encourage you to be sneaky. Basim has been trained to fight by the hidden ones, but for him, combat is a last resort, <laughs> and his main approach is to hunt and strike while remaining. That unmoved. Golem game looked so we also busted, our enemy dude. AI to improve detection and vanishing loops, making so our behaviors busted. more responsive and readable. New enemy archetypes will also increase the stakes. The marksman can shoot your eagle and prevent you from using it. The spearman pokes through haystacks, and orn bearer can call for reinforcements. That's where your assassin skills come in handy. During his training in Alamut, Basim learns the ways of the Creed from his mentor, Roshan, and his fellow Hidden Ones. We get to see him learn the tenets and philosophies that will guide him through his missions, like hiding in plain sight. Social stealth is making a return. We're bringing back the systemic blending with larger crowds that tell you to move undetected. I think I think this is going to be a very popular game, honestly. Bribes, I, I think that uh, you know, tokens. obviously, Assassin's no, Creed's done very well for Ubi. <laughs> it's one of the it's one of the there's a reason they push these things out like flipping uh as an assassin your core mission you know is to track I mean? down and uh, eliminate the order it's been of the ancients their, and free back like, that really their, their most successful franchise in our game the hidden they've got others too don't get me wrong they got all the bureaus tom clancy the stuff and they've got on the order. The uh, in things the like act as gameplay hubs, uh far cry and stuff like that but objectives. um from rescue missions to assassinations and help the hidden ones in their fight for freedom we want you to feel truly immersed it seems like they have a really tough one, time doing uh, a whole lot of stuff outside the of their and, information with and uh, then, I think they the needed right, to get back to what made Assassin's Creed We've so popular in the first place. Which and I think they're, they're going to do a good job with this one, And with our black box missions, we give you the freedom to approach key assassination missions however you see fit. We know how excited our community is. We also have a nice surprise for our long timers. We implemented a nostalgic visual filter as an option for those who wish to explore the game with a desaturated blue-gray color palette from the very first AC game. This is a project led by a team of passionate people who have their very own vision of the Assassin experience in mind. There is much to come, and we can't wait to unveil more about Basim's journey. There you go. There you go. Um, yeah, since the video was released by Ubi, fans have taken to social media platforms to express their immense joy with the new gameplay trailer. Uh, critics and content creators have been seen tweeting about the details of Assassin's Creed Mirage game, helping the players and fans to get a sneak peek of the new game. Um, many fans are excited about the new parkour techniques offered by this new game. Uh, parkour similar to Ezio games. Does that mean a manual jump button and high-profile, low-profile prof mode? Some of them also express their excitement 
about this new edition of the Assassin's Creed franchise. They love this nostalgia idea of bringing back classic attributes of the game. It's been a long time coming for a Back to the Roots AC game. Love what it's become, but uh, to go back is also very exciting. Yeah. Yep. I'll link it if you need more out of it or just want to watch the trailer again or whatever. I do think that's exciting for a lot of AC fans. Pokemon to release complete pocket guide. Uh, Pokemon has spent years introducing new generations of pocket monsters that have allowed trainers to explore new regions and capture over 1,000 creatures. As the series continues to be a juggernaut in the gaming world with the likes of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, while also releasing its latest anime season in Pokemon Horizons. A new guidebook is looking to give fans a closer look at some of their favorite monsters. Though Ash Ketchum might have departed the anime series, new trainers are taking the reins for a new generation. At present, there are nine unique generations of Pokemon that have been introduced since the series arrived in the late 90s. Normally, the generations will arrive with a new video game entry the Nintendo normally, uh, with Nintendo normally focusing their respective entries on new regions that players can explore. In Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, the latest games only switch. The Paldea region was introduced along with the ninth generation of Pocket Monsters. As has been the case with Ash Ketchum's journey in the past, the new stars of the anime, Liko and Roy, are set to explore the Paldea region in the latest series, taking up where the world champion had left off. Uh, Viz Media recently announced that the Pokemon, the complete Pokemon Pocket Guide, um, will arrive in North America in spring of next year. While not releasing an exact release date, Guidebook is touting a large, the large number of pocket monsters that it will be covering. While not every creature will get page time, the book is touting that it will explore around 898 Pokemon in total. You need more out of it? Here you go. Lots of Pokemon nowadays. Um, oh, really? Yeah, Psycho. Oh, right on, dude. Yeah, I respect that, yeah. I was really interested in playing the games when they first came about, and then as Ubi just continued, I, I, I got to where it was like, they lost hype for me because they just push them out so fast, you know? It was just like, God. I just, I, it was hard for me to want to dive into that series because they just, they push them out so fast. There's so many of them, dude. Was it? There's like 15 year anniversary. There's 12 mainline entries, 17 spinoffs. They said the 15 year anniversary was last year of Assassin's Creed. They had, at that point, 12 mainline entries. 17 spinoff games it was like god dude it's just it's hard for me to see how you can get hyped about that you know but i i know a lot of people love ac this upcoming game is pinocchio with a touch of bloodborne and bioshock dude i can't wait for this game i've been watching this through development for a long time summer games fest was held on june 8th and and though the lack of any feminine presence whatsoever was disappointing we at least got some exciting game news. People were most excited about the newest trailer for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, the upcoming Witcher Season 3 trailer, and of course Nicolas Cage's debut in the horror game Dead by Daylight. Nick Cage looked good, dude. Yeah, it was cool. Um, one thing that really caught my attention was Lines of P, a seemingly random title thrown out amidst all these other bombastic names. Dude, Lines of P has been everywhere for a while now. I don't know how this was random for anybody everything about it spoke to a uniqueness that could either ultimately be another average rpg or something pretty special um so if you guys didn't get to see the trailer here it is this is the newest trailer specifically for the showcase that just popped off but um i've been following this through development for a while and i'm really hopeful it'll be good because the premise around this you know pinocchio traditionally is a very dark story Disney's turned every fairy tale into some kind of like foo-foo magical feel-good story, which is absolutely absurd in my opinion. I'm a bit biased. I like dark stories. Fairy tales traditionally, though, were very dark, dark tales meant to scare people in, you know, especially children into um, s staying safe, right? And um, Pinocchio is no different. Uh, the original Pinocchio tells a very dark, dark story. And... Um, 
it's cool to see a game take on more of that that dark ominous kind of vibe around Pinocchio um, and bring it into like a souls like vibe too Jiminy. Um, so, September 19th, yeah. Um, I mean, as, as <laughs> is the case with me nowadays with just about anything, aside from specific developers that I'm comfortable with because I, I, I know that they're pretty good at releasing games, you know, I don't know that I'll play it on release. I'm just too I'm too sketched out by so many developers anymore. You know, we're we're just plagued in the industry anymore with how uh, games release in bad states, and and um, I'm tired of getting scammed. I know many of you are too. And I don't know if I'll play that on release or not, but we'll definitely be taking a look at it um, on release to see how it does. And and uh, you know, yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. So uh, I hope it's going to be very good. It's been in development for quite a while, and and uh, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for every game to be good. I never want a game to be bad, dude. But that's just not the reality of the world we live in, especially currently. Uh, it seems much more often than not that we deal with bad releases than good releases, and I think it's appropriate um, for people to be hesitant about playing games um, on release, and especially not pre-ordering stuff, you know. Until you you get a sense of what the game's gonna feel like on release, so we'll see what happens. But I'm really psyched for this. Per its Steam page, the game describes itself as a thrilling Souls-like. It takes the story of Pinocchio, turns it on its head, sets it against the darkly elegant backdrop of the uh, Belle Epoque era. From what I see in this trailer, turning it on its head means making Pinocchio look like a cross between Hal Pendragon and uh, Timothy uh, Chalamet, and setting him loose to set things right. The page goes on to say. Um, you are a puppet created by Geppetto, who's caught in a web of lies with unimaginable monsters and untrustworthy figures standing between you and the events that have befallen the world of Lies of P. You are awakened by a mysterious voice that guides you through the plague city of Krat, a once lively place that has been poisoned by madness and bloodlust. In our souls like, you must adapt yourself and your weapons to face untold horrors, untangle the unfathomable secrets of the city's elites, and choose whether to confront Predicaments with the truth or weave lies to overcome them on the journey to find yourself. Lies. Lies. <laughs> All at once, this seems reminiscent of many good titles. As a soul's like and with aesthetics in mind, Lies of P bears a strong resemblance to Bloodborne right out the gate. The enemy and world design is also reminiscent of the Bioshock series as well as Alice Returns to Madness. Uh, the combat itself promises to be unique in its combination of weapons and abilities, but what I'm most interested in is how much emphasis they're putting on choice, and namely the choice to tell the truth, to comfort others, or to lie. Krat apparently was once a great city with its primary industry being puppetry. Did the puppets turn against the people? Or were the puppets made of people? The more I learn about this game, the more I'm excited to actually play it. Central to the game is Pinocchio himself, who is also described as being on a journey to find himself, so to speak. Was Pinocchio a pawn to Geppetto? Was he set free? How much of the game will revolve around true role-playing? How can we define who Pinocchio is as a character? It's certainly a departure from most retellings of this fable, even uh, Guillermo de Toro's standards, but I'm looking forward to seeing how it shapes up. Yeah, September 19th, it will... Uh, you can already play the demo on Windows, PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Series S, and X. I'm pretty excited. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Psycho. Yeah, no doubt, dude. Here you go. If you guys need some more out of this. 
Um, PS Plus and Game Pass are dying, and I couldn't be happier. I've already kind of talked about this a little bit. Let's re let's read what this author has to say, and I, I want to throw some of my own sentiments in here, I think. Um, so a reader explains why they're pleased that subscriptions aren't selling as well as expected, and yet single-player game sales are soaring. The best news I have heard in a very long time for video games has nothing to do with an announcement or rumor or even a positive review, but the fact that Game Pass and PS Plus have been exposed as the bad idea that they are. The report basically stay, says that subscription services for games have hit a ceiling and they're not growing anymore. Publishers have realized that actually they're better uh, off just carrying on making single-player games instead. Been a lot of talk lately about the bad decision making of publishers, and it's really, really is hard to see how Sony could have thought PlayStation Showcase was a good idea, while everything related to Activision Blizzard acquisition has been embarrassing for everyone involved. Even things like making a mess of the release schedules with with big new games always coming out within just days of each other shows how badly organized and stubborn they are. In this case, though, I think it's a case of publishers being reasonably sensible at first, as I'm sure the idea of being the Netflix of games must have seemed really tempting especially as Microsoft had started to prove that the idea could work with Game Pass, so Sony felt they needed to compete with their own equivalent. Look, let me let me go ahead and stop real quick, and let's talk about something right here. Xbox. Microsoft Xbox has never been able to compete in this industry on the same front as Sony has which is mostly on hardware and proprietary first-party software sales. They just haven't been able to do it. Um, almost every single generation of Xbox has sold roughly half as many consoles as PlayStation has. And we're not even talking about Nintendo, even though Nintendo is a big competitor in the console market too, Nintendo is their own kind of niche entity. They're like the Disney, right, of gaming. They've got their own. It's hard for anybody to really compete with Nintendo, right? They've got they they've just got this their own thing. Really, uh, for the console market, Xbox and Nintendo are are the you know closer to each other, and therefore they compete with one another more closely than Nintendo ever will with with the other two. Uh, not that they don't compete. Again, I'm not saying that, but there's there's just something that sets them apart. Um, so, to be fair, Xbox has always had to come up with ways to compete in the uh, industry that were a bit outside the box, inventive, and unique, and uh, kind of trendsetting, if you will, right? Um so that's where you see Xbox step in with things like Game Pass and their cloud gaming service, uh, things like that, right? Where it has been successful for them. You can't say it hasn't been. We can pull up numbers. And um, it's actually been very, very lucrative for them. It's like it, Game Pass is like their golden egg. You know, it's, 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 it's or their golden goose. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's it's been what's really uh, continued to lift Xbox up, right? Um, so for for probably the past five to six to seven years, really. Uh, when did Game Pass really come out? Like twenty seventeen, something like that. And um, so I mean to say that. There wasn't like necessarily significant. I, I just want people to understand that like the reason this came about with Microsoft and Xbox first and foremost was kind of out of necessity. They've never been able to compete on the same front uh, as Sony has. And they knew they wouldn't be able to either. So they found other ways to compete, right? June 2017. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, thanks. So, um, and it's done very well for them. But this is what's funny about this whole competition between Sony and Xbox, right? One second. Uh. 
Oh, sorry, guys. Um, the funny thing about it is that, like, while you know, so all Sony, it seems like all Sony ever wants to do is just sit back and do what they always have, right? Which is sell that hardware and sit on those first party titles. They don't want to like change and, and move forward with the way the evolution of the gaming industry is changing, which is like subscription service, cloud gaming, things like that, right? But they've sat back and they've watched Microsoft and Xbox do these things and push the industry forward and be inventive and, and come up with these different, you know, segments of, of um, profitability, you know, for, for their gaming ventures and things like that. And uh, finally, Sony goes, okay, I guess we need to dive into this. And they basically just like copy everything that Microsoft and Xbox does, you know? Yo, Davey, what's up, buddy? How you feeling, dude? So um, it's not that like maybe Sony doesn't have their own kinds of things that they do. Don't get me wrong. But... As far as like being really kind of trend setting in in the industry and stuff on on some of these newer fronts like like Xbox has with with the subscription services, the cloud gaming stuff like that, Sony's been well behind the ball, right? And they waited a long time to really jump into it uh, the same way that uh, Xbox and Microsoft had because Xbox had to, they had to find a way to compete. Whereas Sony just has always wanted to do what they've always done. And you can tell that by, you know, the same thing. Like Sony even came out with a statement, you know, where after they completely revamped PS Plus and made it the subscription service it is today, which rolled out what May of last year, you know, um, to be more competitive with what Xbox does with Game Pass. You know, they were basically quoted as saying, I think it was Jim Ryan actually, was like, our day one release, or uh, our our uh, first party games, our proprietary games for uh, PlayStation will never be day one releases on our subscription service. And that's still the biggest thing that sets apart the, the subscription services. Xbox has always done that for their ultimate subscribers, and Sony won't, right? And Sony stands by that. They're still trying to, you know... Be like, well, we'll have a subscription service, but we're not going to give you the same thing Microsoft gives you because we want to continue to do the same thing we've always done, right? Um, yeah, yo, yeah. Well, I mean, so yeah, I guess you know, Xbox and and um, Microsoft have always kind of been like, hold my beer, you know what I mean? Hold my beer. Let's let's see what we can do here, you know. And and Sony's like, let's see how that plays out for them. And then five years later, they'll copy it. You know what I mean? It does kind of seem like that on some fronts, doesn't it? Um, but it's uh, uh, some of it has been because, again, uh, Sony, uh, you know, or not Sony, but Microsoft and Xbox, they've had to find ways to be more competitive. Which is one of the things that also has always has, has seemed really funny to me about this whole, like, acquisition. You know, Sony's been like, oh, this is anti-competitive. You know, <laughs> the acquisition of Activision Blizzard by uh, Xbox and Microsoft, you know, they're like, this is anti-competitive, this can't happen, you know, when really what, what it, it always looked more like to me was like, that's actually an anti-competitive stance by Sony, because Sony doesn't want things to change. They want to continue to sit on top. They don't want to have to do the same thing that Microsoft and Xbox have always had to do on the console front and their gaming front of being inventive and creative and had to lead the way and try new things and see what works. And Sony wants to sit back. They want to do what they always have, which is sell console, sell hardware, and sell proprietary games. So for, 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 they don't want things to change. And they know, <laughs> Sony knows, that if Microsoft is able to acquire Activision Blizzard, it's going to change the ballgame. So it's always been kind of a funny thing to me. Having oatmeal? Word, dude. Is it good? What kind of oatmeal? So uh, only this time it turns out that Sony was right to be wary of the idea. And despite everyone criticizing them for not releasing games day one on PS Plus, it seems they were right to say that it didn't make sense to just give away your most popular games. When you put it like that, it does seem ridiculous that Microsoft thought opposite. I, I, again, I'll disagree here. 
Everyone thought Microsoft could afford to absorb the cost and lose all that potential income, but it seems that even they needed to make money at some point, which is why they ended up raising the price. Look, so they have, ever since they came out with their subscription, sir, this person is looking at this all wrong. They're looking at this all wrong. The entire play here is that Microsoft and Xbox Literally, they don't make money off their consoles anyways. The cost of manufacturing, it, it literally, you know what I mean? <laughs> it balances out on their hardware. And um, the big thing for them was like, they took a different approach to being successful in this gaming industry. And it they took a chance. Don't get me wrong. But they took a different approach than what Sony has always done which was because they weren't selling as much hardware. They weren't making money off their hardware like Sony was, and they, they weren't selling as much proprietary first-party software. They weren't making as much money off software as Sony was. They said, we're going to make this sub subscription platform, and how are we going to get more people into the, the, the subscription service? What is going to entice people to come over and be a part of our service as a subscription platform for gaming? Day one releases. And again, you have to be bought into their highest tier to get that. It's not like everybody that buys in gets those day one releases, right? So this is all marketing. This is not like just willy-nilly stuff that they just were like, oh, let's just do this. They've got huge marketing and, and consumer-based divisions that, that research this stuff, you know what I mean? Uh, and they figured out a way to drive consumers into their new subscription-based platform based on a big pool was day one releases, right? Yeah, that makes sense, Davey. That makes sense. Yeah, I agree. You might be wondering though why I'm glad the whole thing is being exposed as just a it's not a fad, dude. That doesn't work. So this is all from a reader that, that sent this in, by the way, or uh, somebody wrote this like just a uh, that sent this in. It's it's because I don't like anything that distracts from normal business of making video games. Normal business of video games. This sounds like somebody that has like. <laughs> more importantly it's because what they've realized sells a lot better is single player games and that's exactly what i want more of oh my god dude you know what sells better games that perform well it doesn't there are all kinds of people that like live service games there are all kinds of people that like single player games there are people that like uh like local co-op couch co-op games there are people that gravitate i like all kinds of games you know what i mean this person's got kind of a biased take on this, dude. I'm calling it. One of the problems with subscriptions is they found that people only have time for a few games at a time. Having access to more doesn't really help them. So now Sony and Microsoft know that what really sells, what really makes the money and makes people want to buy a particular console is high-end single-player games. Not live service titles or even normal online multiplayer, but proper games. This person talks like subscription services are going to die. They're not. Subscription services aren't going away. It's like cloud gaming too. Cloud gaming is not going away. It's only going to get more prominent. Okay. I'm calling that right now. Well, let's pull up some numbers real quick. So this person wants to talk like subscription services are dying, right? Yeah, I mean, dude, I, 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 I think that everybody has their preference, right? And that's okay. But to project like, you know, uh, everybody feels the same. Like this person's writing this like everybody feels the same way or everybody should feel the same way they do or something. You know what I mean? That's not the way that works, you know? And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's like everybody should 
should be living in the same world they do or something. That's weird. Um, the problem is that even though the results, how that, uh, how that subscriptions aren't that popular, dude, subscriptions are very popular. All right, let's look at some numbers, dude. It all seems so unsustainable. The sort of thing that's likely to turn the industry upside down for years before it's fixed. That's because the industry is changing and you still want things to be the way they always have. You know what I mean? This is somebody that's like not... This is the way I see this. It's inevitable that the industry changes with the way technology changes and, and we, we, the way we approach our entertainment changes and stuff. It's not always an easy thing. Don't get me wrong, you know. Whether you talk about traditional consoles being taken over into more of a mobile realm like we see with a Switch or Steam Deck, you know. Um, I think eventually we'll get to a point where we won't have like traditional consoles anymore, you know. Like, or at least what we know traditional consoles to be. It's an evolutionary kind of thing. You know, it'll be more like, I, I think the Switch nailed it, dude, to be honest. Currently, where we're at with technology, I think the Switch nailed it. Um, they were ahead of the game, actually. They need a new console now because it's been way too long. But, um, you know, I, I think that's more along the lines of where, uh, because mobile technology has, has evolved greatly. It provides a great opportunity because so many people are on the go. You know, that kind of thing is changing. Subscription service is actually a good thing for, for a lot of people. It doesn't make sense to buy into it if you're not getting your money's worth out of it, right? But there are a lot of people that do find it to be a, a more appealing option than just because honestly, like oh, we'll, we'll we'll compare some numbers for a second, okay? And I'll show you, like the amount of money. So, and I've said this from the get go with Sony, okay? With Sony subscription service, you literally, like, compared to to, to like Xboxes and everything, and the 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 like. Unreleased games to buy, how much they cost compared to like what you would pay a year for Sony and get that much gaming out of it. You know what I mean? It's gonna everybody's gonna feel different. Everybody's gonna approach it different and everything. But there's, I think it does make sense to like take a look at um, what you get out of like Game Pass versus PS Plus. And with Game Pass, you're getting day one releases for a year's worth of Ultimate, whereas PS Plus, you're not. You don't get day one releases. It doesn't matter what tier you buy into, right? And all it takes is like, like what, a, a AAA game on release is 70 bucks now, right? So um, there's a lot to look into, yeah, in, in regards to, but this is a really weird take, dude. Um, look at this. Let's take a look at some stats real quick. Um, we should be able to find this. As of last year, Microsoft claimed that there were over 25 million people currently subscribed to their Game Pass service. 25 million. That was last year, 25 million. <clears throat> yep. That's not a small amount, dude. That doesn't sound like a subscription service that's dying. I mean, you would also need to take a look at trends and what's, you know, up and down for 
subscriber base and stuff. And I can tell you, subscriber numbers are probably down right now across both because, and I said this when we first found this article, subscriber numbers are probably down right now across PS Plus, Xbox Game Pass, any other subscription service too. Numbers are probably down because games are releasing in a terrible state right now. So there's not a whole lot of new stuff coming out that's actually worth, you know, because especially for Game Pass, that's their big ploy, right? Like we were talking about. Game Pass's big ploy is to like pull people in. Pull people in for the ultimate side of their, their subscription service. Um, and you get those day one releases, right? But and that's just 25, that's 25 million users, Doug. That's not dollars. That was 25 million concurrent users subscribers so take 25 million subscribers across their different tiers of payment options you know what i mean and add that up <laughs> that's a lot of money bro that's a lot of money so to say that like their subscription service is like dying or dead or whatever i guarantee their numbers are down right now because one of their biggest ploys is pulling in people on their like day one releases and the one of their biggest recent day one releases was like Redfall, <laughs> you know? So they've definitely dipped, dude. Their subscriber base has dipped and it's a volatile thing. It's always going to flux, you know, it's going to go up and down depending on what content's out there. They're always like twice a month game pass and we're just focusing on game pass, not PS plus right now, but game pass twice a month is putting new games on and taking old games off. You know what I mean? So depending on, on what the selection of games is, is out there, it's going to bring more people in or, or have more people leave or whatever, right? So they know that. But Redfall was a day one release and it was a crap game. So, you know, that subscriber base, the su subscriber numbers for Game Pass was going to, you know, go down a bit. Now, you, we all know what's coming though, right? Starfield. Starfield's a day one release. There's some other big games hitting a uh, day one release. Uh, we got things like um, Exo Primal from Capcom. There's some other big big name games that are coming out that people are going to want to play. So um, you know, towards the middle of this year uh, and through the fall, those numbers are going to peak back up again, right? So it's weird for me to to to. It's it's always crazy for me to hear people spout. Kind of what seems to me more like a personal almost vendetta without any kind of substantial information behind it. Like, dude, if, if you actually want to come at a, a viewpoint like this, put some numbers behind it or something. Give me some stats. Show me something. You know what I mean? Give me something substantial to go off of information-wise. Give me some stats, dude, and uh, make me believe your point. But to just sit here and try to spout some nonsense about how um, subscriber, you know, gaming subscription services are dying, dog, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. <laughs> yeah, no worries, Mithril. No worries, dog. Yeah. So I, I just think I, I find this kind of and this is this is the stuff that, you know, I try to advise people on all the time. You know, it's it's not a bad thing to have your own take on something, you know what I mean? But to um, project information like this out on other people without any kind of factual. Concrete info behind it, you know, this is where people start uh, regurgitating misinformation, in my opinion. So. Be careful about reading this kind of stuff because a lot of this just didn't make sense to me. They took somebody, somebody sent in an article. Uh, a reader explains why they're pleased with subscriptions aren't selling as well as expected. Where, where, why, why do you, where did you come off even initially saying that they're not selling as well? I don't, I haven't seen anything saying that subscription services are like not selling right now or dying. I'm I'm willing to believe that they're not doing great right now because game game releases have been just atrocious here recently. But where's your where's your factual like st statistical information to, you know, 
push forth that fact to me. It's nowhere. They're just they're spewing garbage, dude. They're spewing garbage. This is this is you know that's why I mean even if it's fact check your stuff, dude. Everywhere fact check it. Go research it. Don't just spew this crap out. Give me a break, man. And I didn't even fact check a lot of that. You know what I mean? It's like we, we would need to look at numbers, the way uh, things have risen and fallen for subscriber base across both those services and things like that. But I can tell you, I mean, just as of last year, 25 million subscribers, that's a lot of people, dude. That's a lot of money. God of War Studio may be making a new sci-fi game. Santa Monica, the team behind God of War, may be working on a new sci-fi game. PlayStation houses some of the best developers in the industry with the likes of Naughty Dog and Somniac. Naughty Dog can get wrecked for that uh, Last of Us Part 1 release. I don't care if people are going to go, well, it was Iron Galaxy that did it. It was Naughty Dog's name that was on that game. They're the ones that hired Iron Galaxy to uh, port The Last of Us over to PC. And then released it as a big, hot pile of naughty dog crap. Insomniac Games is Sony Santa Monica. Yo, Sony Santa Monica did a bang-up job with uh, God of War. 2018's God of War. Dude, that port was so good. I think that game's on sale right now, too. It allows for some uh, world-class lineups every generation, spawning industry-defining games like The Last of Us or the reboot of God of War. A lot of these studios have stuck with the franchises they know for the last decade, but it seems like the team at Sony Santa Monica is interested in branching out a bit more. We knew God of War director Corey Barlog had passed the torch to Eric Williams as Barlog was busy with other projects. We have been left in the dark for some time as to what this could be, but the rumor has it it's a sci-fi game of some kind. Um, with that said, it seems like Sony Santa Monica writer Alana Pierce may have slipped up and confirmed that. On the Play, Watch, Listen podcast, Pierce was talking with Mike Biffle, who noted that he was working on this unspecified sci-fi franchise, Pierce giggled at the vague description and said, same. Of course, she could just be joking around, but given the rumors have already suggested this to be the case, it wouldn't be surprising if she more or less just mistakenly corroborated those rumors. It doesn't really give us anything to go off of, though. It's unclear if this game would be a new IP or if it's a video game set in a popular sci-fi universe. Mm. Okay. That's all we got. If you want to take a look at any of that, but that's about it. What are they talking about here? Lisfanga. Whenever I look back at a list of everything announced during a big video game reveal showcase, I usually find that I have no memory of at least a few games. Yeah, I think that's the norm. Despite the fact that I definitely saw them, that was exactly the case with Lisfanga. The Time Shift Warrior, the indie action game, was announced near the end of Summer Games Fest two-hour broadcast. By that point, my brain was at capacity. Simply couldn't remember yet another game at that point. Goddess of Time. This did look dope. It's got like a Hades vibe to it almost. It's kind of wild. And fight again alongside your past Gothic. I'm here again. Check it out. This got some Hades. This gave me Hades vibes. It looks kind of wild. That's another me. I look good. I rewind. I begin again, but with another me to fight with. You're coming. With like roguelike. Got that that like three quarters top down vibe. It's got the the Hades combat feel to it. You know what I mean? It seems like. You're not the only become legion and crush these demons. Onwards. Um, after actually getting to play Lisfanga at a press event following Summer Games Fest, I certainly won't forget it again. The time-shifting action game is an ingenious indie that turns basic hack and slash combat into a st strategic puzzle game. It's an incredibly clever, satisfying idea that you'll want to keep on your radar. Send it in the clones. Yeah, at first glance, uh, Lisfanga seems relatively basic. Top-down linear action game where players cut through arenas of full enemies. Combat is basic enough with two attack buttons that send the main character hacking through enemies. Have a magic spell that can blast enemies from afar. And a uh, super ability that can take a out-of-pack of enemies quickly. It's all a standard for the genre. 
that's where the twist comes in. When I enter an arena, I actually only have around 15 seconds to cut through as many as I can. When that timer runs out, time runs back, and I start back from the beginning of the room as a copy of myself called a remnant. Everything I did in those first 15 seconds happens as I control my second character. As a ghost version of my first run plays out in real time. The goal here is to clear every enemy in a room in one go using as many remnants as I need to wipe out, wipe them out in one room. Working together with every past version of myself. Yeah, yeah, Psycho, yeah. Yo, thanks for the sub, buddy. Yeah, we'll see you in a little bit, dude. Be safe. So on one run, I might focus on the left side of an arena, take out every enemy there. On my second, I move to the right and take uh, care of that side. On my final run, I'll see my first two remnants taking care of those enemies on the sides as I clean up the ones in the middle. One of those video game magic tricks that's a delight to see unfold every time. That system gets even more complex, too. At one point, I'm introduced to two enemies linked together with a strand. I need to make sure they're both killed at the same time during a, uh, during a run, leaving me to carefully time my remnants' attacks so they line up with one another. Later, I have to take down a much bigger enemy who protects itself with a massive shield. To beat it, I use one remnant to draw its attention for a, a few seconds. Then I will rewind time and run back a, around its back while it's distracted by that previous clone. While it's primarily an action game, it's almost become a strategic puzzler. At the start of every encounter, I have the ability to pan the camera around the room so I can see where every enemy is. That lets me pre-plan a series of routes that I can send remnants on to take everything down with efficiency. When it all clicks, it feels less like slashing through enemies and more like solving a puzzle. It's a more cerebral hack and slash uh, that feels especially tailored to my interests. Yeah, I uh, I think I meant to wishlist that one and I forgot here. Yeah, I didn't wishlist that one. Uh, I'll link it for you guys too. This did look like a really cool game. I love Hades too, dude. Hades is so good and it gives me those vibes. Uh, it's right there in chat if you want to see it on uh, Steam. Wishlist that. And I'll give you this article too. I didn't mean to do that, dude. There you go. Resistor is basically a burnout RPG and I'm totally into it. Um, Mad Max meets uh, Fast X in the scintillating racing game with a story built as a CA RPG. Uh, let me pull this up. I know we saw this, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's watch this real quick. So, why are we really doing this? I thought you hated. Oh my yourself. God, dude! We were out we yesterday evening, and this dope going to walk away with this old challenger was in front of us, dude. I'm not sure exactly what year it was, but dude, it was orange. Like my color of orange, and it was so flipping cherry, dude. I got a few pictures of it, but I need to uh, edit it so I don't put the license plate in there or anything. I'm gonna put it in the Discord for you guys to see. This flipping challenger, dude, was so sick. Not challenger. Sorry, sorry. It was a uh, it was a Chevelle. Dude. I have a challenger. Like <laughs> yeah, that looks wild, dude. That looks wild. We'll put it on there. Let's take let's take a read at this. Um, so Mad Max meets Fast X, a uh, brand new RPG that's all based around epic car races with burnout s crashes, stunts, and plenty of explosions. Um. You play as Aster, a young racer who's racing to earn a ticket to gain permanent citizenship inside one of the urban metropolises left in 2060 Earth and get the health care their mother urgently needs. Uh, this ticket can only be gained by competing in an annual racing tournament set by one of the world's most powerful corporations. This tournament involves a series of high-speed death races where you'll have to pull off crazy stunts and get involved in vehicle combat. Um, it's as much about winning that dream ticket as it is trying to dismantle the system especially as the truth about these metropolises may not be quite as idyllic as the corporations make out. Outside of the races, Resistor has an open world to explore where you'll, you'll find plenty of characters to befriend. Seek help from as you build your crew. Plus, by helping them, you can also boost your reputation. Resistor has multiple endings too, so managing your relationships and your successes really counts. You can also customize your clothes and your car along the way because you got to look good when you're winning. Got to have that lipstick, baby. 
No launch date yet, but it should be coming to PC on Steam and Epic, Switch, PS5, and Series X. Yep, yep. Uh, let me get you that uh, link, by the way. Hold on. I don't think I linked that. Yeah, here. So. There's that Steam link. Cool. Um, video games. Future is bright. Xenoblade Chronicles 3 Future Redeemed. Yeah, a lot of people uh, liked Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Looks like there's going to be a uh, DLC side campaign, Future Redeemed. Serving as the final piece of the story spanning three Xenoblade games and set in the distant past of Xenoblade 3, Future Redeemed follows Matthew, a young man possessing the power of Ouroboros, as he desperately searches for his lost sister, Nail. After the destruction of their hometown and death of their grandfather, only to be swept up in a conflict that could shake the very foundation of the world. Can't be overstated, however, how much of this campaign is packed full of references to, uh, to the previous entries, from locations and characters to blink and you miss it, details like animations and attack names. Future Redeem feels in some regards like a true love letter to Xenoblade as a whole. Future Redeem is definitely a blast to play, but I'd honestly be lying if I said this DLC didn't leave me wanting more, especially in terms of story. Wonderful compliment to Xenoblade Chronicles 3, a terrific send-off for the decade-spanning story that many fans have grown up with, and a great game in its own right. For all its strengths and weaknesses, it's absolutely worth a play for any uh, fan of the series. Cool. There you go. If you like Xenoblade, Xenoblade Chronicles, that might be worth a look for you. There you go. 10 favorite games of uh, Future of Play Direct. Uh, Hermit Pig. Psychoroma. That looks really cool, actually. Ritual Night. Videoverse. Arctic Awakening. Tectonica. Wildmender Rekka. Rekka looks really cool. In Stars in Time. Uh, we, we watched all these together, but, uh, if you want to take a peek, if you didn't get to watch it with us, then, uh, take a look at that article. You might get to see a, a bit of a recap there. Lords of the Falling, it's a new trailer showcasing combat and more. During the future game show on Saturday, uh, yesterday, Lords of the Fallen received a brand new trailer showcasing the game's combat setting and more. In the game, there are new mirrored worlds of the living and the dead, which are linked to each other. Each world will have unique enemies and areas to fight and explore, giving players a varied experience. And like the Dark Souls games that inspired Lords of the Fallen, the bosses will tower over the players, provide tough fights that will test the patience of even the most skilled players. Yeah, this trailer looks good. This game looks good. On behalf of Hexworks, welcome to the Lords of the Fallen gameplay show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, we're taking a closer look at our all new dark fantasy action RPG, mm. arriving this October on PC, PS5, and Xbox Series X and S. Spiritual successor to the original 2014 release, it acts as a full reboot for the franchise, taking place in a vast, interconnected world over a thousand years later. Uh, Featuring colossal boss battles, fast, challenging combat, and deep, immersive storytelling, players will journey. Across Isn't it two funny? Just like how many games have have like RPG <laughs> come to emulate the, the, uh, the, the Soulsborne Axiom, stuff, you know? And the world of the dead, Umbro, with each featuring its own. I mean, it's just such a very popular thing, man. People enemies, love it. And of course, treasures. And while Axiom presents its but this own game looks dope. Untold it looks very good in its nightmarish counterpart. Thanks to the umbral lamp, players can enter this lightless world at any time in one of two ways. When slain by the foes of Axiom, at which point you'll resurrect in the same location, albeit in umbral, or by performing the umbral rift and willingly sacrificing one of your two lives. But the lamp holds yet more power, granting the ability to flay the soul from an enemy for some high damage attacks 
and even manipulate the very environment of the umbral world. Over here. However, Sorry, wrong game. You spend in this wraith-ridden plane, the greater number of spectral terrors that will hunt you down. But as harrowing as the Hellions of Umbral are, they pale in comparison to the game's brutal boss battles. Towering above the ever-burning city of Kalrath, this gargantuan monstrosity doesn't take kindly to would-be adventurers, the demonic presence within ready to devour any and all within sight. A merciless torturer, prepared to carry out any atrocity in the name of his faith. Tancred, master of castigations, is the devout chaplain of the hallowed sentinels. Though beneath the pious veil, his very own flesh conceals a truth most foul. When Harrower Dervla ventured into the deepest depths of this world to thwart the undead rising, what she discovered was so utterly horrific that she renounced her former life in commitment to a far darker oath. Pre-order Lords of the Fallen now and prepare to unleash the darkness on Friday the 13th of October. 13 October, man! Yeah. All right. That 1,000 years after the events of 2013's Lords of the Fallen, the upcoming game will serve as a complete reboot of the franchise. Hence, the name remains the same. The game will allow players to go through the campaign alone or invite a friend to help progress in what developer Hexworks calls uninterrupted online co-op. With two aforementioned worlds, players who enter the world of the dead will have to progress in order to get back into the world of the living. Launches Friday, October 13th. Friday the 13th. Sick. For PS5, Xbox Series X, S, and PC. Awesome. Yo, check this out. AMD Risen 5 5600X3D rumor for tales of a budget AM4 gaming champ. New AM4 chip may boast the same 96 megs of 3D vCache as its bigger brother, dude. A red team-centric leaker with a good track record has shared details of a purported AMD Risen 5 5600X3D that could vie for a spot on our list of best CPUs for gaming. Image shared via a uh, chili dog. <laughs> Looks like a hastily snapped inventory or similar screen with a, the new and unannounced AMD Risen 5 5600X3D listed alongside the tried and tested Risen 7 5800X3D. Some of the key specs of the purported new AM4 X3D affordable gaming Champ are listed in the Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, though we ask you to please and add plenty of salt to this unsourced, unexplained leak. So this is the first X3D that came out was the 5800 on the AM4 platform, right? Then earlier this year, like at the end of February, they released their Risen 9 7000 series um, X3D processors. And I just thought that that was where they were going to like entirely move forward with, right? So this was like their test bed for the X3D, which is like they said, the level three cache. This is stuff you don't see on, or we haven't really seen on like consumer based CPUs up until this point. It's been literally like, this is like three times what you'll normally see, you know, um, or at, at least double, um, but I didn't think we were really going to get any other X3D processors for the AM4 socket. I thought they were just going to move forward probably and keep uh, producing X3D chips for the AM5. But apparently they might, because they know a lot of people are still running AM4 socket, they might, and it looks like apparently, are still willing to maybe maybe be producing some of these um, these AM4 chips with the X3D uh level three cash boost on them, you know? Um, the first X3D chip from AMD impressively ranked uh, top in our 1080p and uh, 1440p gaming benchmark in June of last year. The 5800X3D had an ace in the hold thanks to its pioneering use of, a, uh, of the 96 megs of level three cash via hybrid bonded 3D stacked SRAM technology. 
According to today's leak, the Risen 55600X3D will have the same capacious 96 megs of level 3 cache. So two less cores, four less threads, uh, three, or it'll have one less meg of level 2 cache, but the same amount of level 3 cache. That's going to be a good shit. If that's real. The uh, 5800X3D was launched at 449, currently available at 290 from Amazon. That's actually linked. There's a link for that in our uh, Gamer Deals section. I found this deal whenever it went live, and I posted that in our Gamer Deals section of our Discord. Um, it'll be interesting to see how AMD retailers price the 5600 uh, if one does indeed become available. Yeah, that's pretty interesting, man. It's not bad necessarily, for sure, to give more options for the AM4. Uh, people still run an AM4 sockets, you know, motherboards. <laughs> Where's Cash at, dude? We need Cash up in here for this article. Um, Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom has the worst voice acting in gaming. <laughs> Uh, a reader's pair. Uh, a reader praises Tears of the Kingdom for being near perfect, except for voiceovers and cutscenes, especially Princess Zelda. I've seen a few people try to pretend that Tears of the Kingdom isn't an instant classic, but let's face it, they're wrong. It's a fantastic game, and while nothing's perfect, the few flaws it has, such as these slightly underwhelming dungeons, are meaningless when judged against the rest of the game, except for one thing: the voiceovers. I get that Nintendo doesn't have much experience with voice acting, um, but the voice acting in Zelda: Tears of the Kingdom is absolutely atrocious. Not in an uh, internet fan exaggerating kind of way but a properly embarrassing and amateurish effort that i cannot believe is sharing the same storage space with one of the best games ever made um i've heard that part of the the problem is that nintendo only uses non-union members and so ends up getting lower tier actors who will work for less money gross dude because they don't make enough money right i have no way of knowing if that's true but that's certainly what it sounds like zelda is obviously the worst they're, uh, they're all awful, and it's genuinely cringy hearing them speak. I talked about this before Tears of the Kingdom even dropped. Nintendo needs to do a better job. I was really hoping they would with Tears of the Kingdom too, but apparently not. Of course, the big day debate with the Zelda games as a whole is whether they should have voices at all. They should carry on just using text. I feel like most devs nowadays, especially big devs, it should be uh, standard for voice acting nowadays. At least in large part. Gives the game its own distinctive atmosphere and helps you put your own spin on the game yourself. It can, yeah. It can also be very, very tedious reading through everything yourself rather than just... I mean, at the very least, I think this is you should give the player the option. Have very good voice acting in the game. And if the player doesn't want it, give an option to turn voice acting off. Problem solved. It's not like Nintendo can't do it. They're a huge developer. I'm not talking about indie developers needing to do this kind of thing. So, but big developers, come on, man. Um, the most famous aspect of the debate is whether Link should talk or not. And I'm very much in the camp that says he shouldn't. Okay, so anybody that thinks that uh, this is the case... Get ready for the movie coming out. Is he just going to be mute the entire time? It'd actually almost be pretty comical. But I mean, dude, we've got a movie coming out now. We already know that Nintendo's come to an agreement with uh, Illumination and Universal to make a Zelda ad adaptation now. You think Zelda's not going to talk through that entire movie? It's time to change, dude. I look, and I know, and I talk about this with Casual all the time. Casual, our buddy Casual Gamer is a huge Zelda fan, dude. And I've played, uh, you know, uh, my early days of gaming were, were big into Zelda and stuff too. But, you know, just because something has always been a certain way doesn't mean it has to stay that way. It, you know... I understand the the nostalgia and stuff and 
And uh, but sometimes things need to change, and people need to understand that. Not always, but sometimes. Like GC, I'm also upset that you can't rename him in the last two games, which I think is because they speak his name in cutscenes. Link isn't a character; he's you. He's your link to the game, and not some predetermined character with his own personality instead of witty one-liners. I don't mind that that much. I've always seen Link as Link, not as me. I'd rather be Ganondorf. <laughs> the voice acting makes Zelda sound like an inf- ineffectual wimp when really most fans prefer to think of her as a strong leader in adventure. That is absolutely not how she comes across in games with voice acting. She probably wasn't much better when you examine the dialogue in the previous games, but the fact that uh, you were only reading it and so adding your own spin as to what she was like in your own head makes all the difference. Maybe she was always w- uh, a wuss, but it's only the Breath of the Wild with Breath of the Wild and its sequel that it's been proven that she is. I thought this point of view was prevalent, although it's hard to tell on the internet, and, uh, and that Nintendo might take note of the problem in the sequel. But if anything, Zelda is even worse than Tears of the Kingdom. The, only, the other voice actors seem worse to me too with all the new characters. And if there's one simple way to describe it, it would be amateurish in complete contrast to the rest of the game. I don't know if this will ever be addressed. One uh, way it might be is if there still is a Zelda move. Oh, there is. Yeah, that's what I was just talking about. It's always seemed like likely as soon as Super Mario Brothers uh, was a hit, but now there seems to be rumors of them actually planning it. Oh, there's contracts now. When did this release? And I don't think Hollywood will want to copy anything about the acting in Tears of the Kingdom. They're, they'll also probably do something about Zelda's personality, which is somehow now more ineffectual than Princess Peach in both the games and movie. Yo, Princess Peach was dope in the uh, Mario movie, by the way. If it, Hollywood can work some magic and the movie is a success, then hopefully Nintendo will take note of all this in the next game. Then we might get a game where the voice acting and dialogue is on par with the rest of the game. Finally, there might be an actually perfect Zelda game. Nope. No game's perfect. I've never seen a perfect game ever. I don't. I, I don't think there ever will be. Even if they had amazing voice acting in this game, I can already tell you the game wouldn't be perfect because quality of life in Nintendo games is actually balls. They're terrible at quality of life in their games. <laughs> Sorry. All right, dude. I went on. I went over this yesterday, but I'm gonna to touch on it again real quick because there's some really good deals right now going on on uh, Green Man Gaming, and um, then we'll touch on our schedule real quick for the day, and then we'll get ready for some grounded until lunchtime. Okay. Um, save big on Steam Deck games for a limited time. Um, I'm not gonna read all this again, but look, there are a ton of games right now on Green Man Gaming. Hi-Fi Rush, uh, Skywalker Saga Lego game, uh, Skyrim. Ghostwire Tokyo, Guardians of the Galaxy for 15 bucks, dude. This game reviewed very well. Didn't sell great, but it reviewed very, very well. Uh, Doom, Red Dead Redemption 2. Let's go. Sifu, Chris Tells, Frostpunk, Fallout 4, Stasis, Mad Max, Evil Within 2. Amazing game by the same developer of Hi Fi Rush. Middle Earth Games, Prey, Pillars of Eternity 2. What a flipping banger, dude. Deadfire, you can get well over 150 to 200 hours in, uh, of this gameplay. I got over 300 hours, and it's fantastic CRPG. You will not be disappointed with uh, Deadfire if you like uh, CRPGs. And Batman Arkham Origins. All these games and more on GOG for really good sales right now. These are all going to be Steam keys, but uh, highly recommend taking a look. A lot of good sales right now. All right, and uh, now the schedule. So, we're finishing up news. We're going to play Grounded until probably about 11.30. So, we got about three hours, uh, maybe a little bit less than that once I get finished with the break. But um, then we'll be watching um, Xbox Starfield Showcase uh, while we do lunch. Then we'll get back into some Grounded for a couple of hours, and then we'll finish the day with the PC Gaming Show at uh, 3 o'clock p.m. or 1,500 hours, our time here in the channel, okay? That's the jam. That's what we're doing, all right? Oh, emote explosion, dude. That's the jam lamb. That's the news for today. Uh, you guys rock. We're going to go do some uh, grounded gameplay until the Xbox uh, Starfield Showcase. So thank you to everybody that was a part of the news segment. It's ama- It was amazing. As always, man, you guys rock. Uh, Thanks for being you and being a part of this. 
Uh, big shout out to our buddy Psycho the Troll for the uh, two month reset. Thanks, brother. Um, if anybody's checking out this video gaming news segment, we have all kinds of cut clips from previous gaming news segments, full video gaming news segments, uh, entire playthroughs that are uh, sectioned out into episodes of games we've played, and just funny clips and stuff of uh, gameplay content and everything like that. All that stuff's out on the YouTube channel and here on the Twitch channel as well and playlists. And uh, if you're enjoying uh, this, I would recommend taking a look at some of that other content. And if you're enjoying what you're seeing, come hang out with myself and the rest of the people that make up this community. Uh, we got a lot of cool people that help create an amazing uh, space here for all of us to hang out in. It's uh, inclusive, safe, welcoming. We have a good time. We laugh a lot. And uh, we just uh, hang out and enjoy the world of video games, man. So uh, come be a part of what we do. We want to have more people uh, come be a part of this. And uh, we'd love to have you. So other than that, man. Happy Sunday. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Be kind to one another. And we will catch everybody tomorrow for uh, June 12th edition of Video Gaming News. All right.